So we have a business at home. God's blessed us with a kennel, you know, where people bring us their dogs, their cats. We have horses. We have chickens. We have geese and cows, too. But anyways, we've applied our faith to the animals. And, I, and we've told you the different stories, like uh, Lizzie, our dog. Um, one morning, we went to let her outside, and, and she bumped her head on the door jam going out. We thought, well, she's just being clumsy. Well, by the end of the day, she was totally blind. We said, what's going on here? So we took her. Well, it was Monday night prayer. So I went to church, and we prayed, gave it a request. We immediately prayed for the, put hands on, the, on her and said, you know, we speak heal and wholeness for her. But I went to church, and we prayed that night. But my wife took her to the vet because, uh, you know, our business is only right that we should go to the vet. Yeah, well, the vet confirmed what we already knew. Yeah, she's blind. Go to the regular vet tomorrow. So the next day, went to the regular vet. Yep, she's blind. And they wanted us to go to a specialist. We'd already spent $400. But that's where your faith comes in. You see, where we get in trouble in life is when we do something without asking God. You want to ask God. He, he cares about every facet of our life. Little decisions, big decisions. You just ask him. He gives us, he leads us mostly, mostly by the inward witness. What's that? That's like the light. You know, when you got a green light, you don't worry about it. You sail on through. When it's turning yellow, you start looking around a little bit. Wow, well, you, you, you slow down a little bit. You get cautious. When it's red, you're looking behind you. Why? Because you know you did something wrong. And you say, boy, I hope the cop's not there. Right? You know what you're saying? All right. Well, that's the way the inner witness works. If we earnestly go to him, because he said that he desires that we would know the truth. He said, if any of us lack wisdom, we should ask, and he give it to us abundantly. Right? So we ask him about everything in our life. And then he doesn't always, it's not going to be an audible voice, or it's not going to be, you know, I want you to eat a McDonald's today. It's not going to be like that, but it's going to be just, you're going to have a confidence, kind of like that green light, that it's okay to go through this. It's okay to do this. But if you've got a hesitancy, then you want to stand, stop a moment and say, okay, God, what's going on here? Do you want me to do something different? My wife tells about right here in Springfield, the light was green and she was ready to go through it, but she just got that inward witness of a red light. Say, no, wait. So she held up for about, what, five seconds, three seconds? And in that time, a, a tractor trailer didn't stop went right on through the light. If she hadn't responded to inward witness, it would have been an accident. Yeah. So see, God speaks to us. He cares for us. And so, this, getting back to Lizzie real quick, we didn't go to a specialist. We said, no, we're using our faith on this. My wife in the parking lot prayed, and God said, well, call your, call your pastor. And so she felt really ridiculous about that. Why well, call the pastor? We don't want to bother him. But she was obedient. And Amen. they said, come on over. So they both laid hands, the husband and wife, on Lizzie for healing. Well, she was still just as blind as before. But she brought her back home, put her under the kitchen table where she felt safe. And uh, start, my wife started doing work. And she, as she was in the kitchen, she looked under the table. And she noticed that our dog's eyes were meeting her eyes. And she said, she yelled to me, Jim, she sees. And so we came out, and there's total recovery of her eyesight, and she still sees. Now, that's a miracle. That's a wonderful miracle. Amen. Well, guess what happened? My wife likes to say the devil's stupid. Yeah. Last Saturday morning, middle of the night, we're letting our other dog out. His name is Manuel. And he's coming in. Manning. He, Manning. I said, well, we, we, we adopted him, and his, his, adopt, his, his name was Manning. But we called him Manuel. We gave him to Jesus. We had a little trouble... This is a good, this is a good, uh, let me add this in, because this is going to help you. When any problem you have, take it to Jesus. He's bigger than we are. He can handle it. And, and we were having a little trouble with this dog. He had come from a home where he didn't have any manners, and, and we couldn't handle him. So we said, we can't do this, Jesus. He's your dog. We gave him to Jesus. And that's when we named him Manuel, for Emmanuel. We called him Manuel. We changed his name. And you know, once we gave him to Jesus, he, he started getting better. It turned it around. And that will happen with any area in our life. If we truly give it to Jesus, let go, don't think we have to do it ourselves, it will change. Because that's, that's how it works. So anyhow, he hit his head on the side about 1 in the morning. Went to bed 5.30 the next morning. We get up. When we get up about 5.30, we like to have about an hour to read the Bible and drink coffee before we start our day. Anyways, 5.30, he was totally blind. We said, what? Another dog blind? How can this be? And that's when we said, well, well, you're a stupid devil. We're not going to even go to a vet this time. We're going to use our faith because we already know that God is a healer. But more than that, you've got to get a verse. And, and in short order, because it was our prayer time anyways, I was reading the Bible. I flipped the Bible open. And what I opened up to was Isaiah 35, verses uh, 3, 
through 6. And when I read this, I knew it was like, my answer. See, once you get a word from God, I don't care what it looks like. You don't go by your senses. It has nothing to do with what you can see, what you can smell, what you can taste, what you can feel. It's got to do with God's word, because God's word is the same, and it's never going to change. But this was what the verse said. It says, strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with a but the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Well, that verse there was for us. You see, there's a condition on that. The next verse says, let me tell you what the next verse says. This was Man, Manuel's verse. It says, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. Okay, but there was a condition on that. It said, let me read it so we get it right. We're talking about the word here. It said, say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. So we couldn't allow... The fact that Manning was walking into the wall, that, that he was a little scared and couldn't see anymore, we couldn't allow the facts to change God's word. We couldn't have fear, because fear would have kept that from happening. Because it, uh, if, it, if, it, if it wasn't necessary, why would it tell us, you who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will do it. And so we gave it to him. We said, we're not going to fear. I don't care that he can't see. God's word is telling me in this next verse, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. So we put it out, put it in the refrigerator. Then you want to do that. Take it serious, the word of God, especially when it gives you one that, that directly applies to your situation. So we put it in the refrigerator. We run it maybe four or five times that day to ourselves and to Manuel. And uh, by 8 o'clock that night, we, we, we went to a church meeting, didn't we? Yeah, we had church that night, so we put him in his crate because he felt comfortable there. We came back at 8 o'clock at night, and he was could totally see. And he's fine. See, that's a miracle. But see, God gave us a word. We stood on it. We, we, we cast our fear on him, and we let him do the rest. <coughs> and God's also done that. We have a goose. And we've told you this story. The goose developed a tumor on top of its head. And uh, we said, well, we're not going to take you to the vet, but we'll put our faith on you. And we prayed for him. Well, it got pretty bad. It got to the point where it split, and it was draining, and all the skin, and, you know, it was just a mess. But... We just prayed for him. Said, "Well, God, well, we know you can heal, and we, we we claim healing for our goose." Well, guess what happened? He, he totally healed up. In fact, even the skin and the feathers, and I didn't know how this could happen because the skin was gone, came back in. And unless you knew there was something wrong with the goose, you never would have known he ever had a tumor there. It's just a little indentation, but the feathers are back and everything. And and so I say this. Well, well, well maybe you maybe you say this. Why is God going to do that for animals? And why does he got to heal your animals? Well, there's two conditions to that. One, we have dominion over them because they're ours. And if we have dominion over them, then we can ask of the Lord to heal them. Ask of the Lord to keep them safe because we have dominion over them. That doesn't necessarily mean that we could pray for somebody else's dog. I mean, we could do it, but we don't have the same dominion as we do over our own because they belong to us. And it says in the Bible that a good man takes care of his livestock. He takes care of his cattle. So that was the first thing, is that we have dominion over him. But the other reason God's doing it is because he wants us to be able to testify and say, if God will hear, heal a goose, if God will bring eyesight back to two dogs, and then we have horse stories, too, where he's healed dog, horses, and we have miracle births. If God would do all these things, how much more is he going to do it for his children that he loves so much? Amen. Us. See, it's just an example. It says in, in Revelations that we overcome by what? The blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. See, really, when you read the Bible, especially the New Testament, a lot of that is just testimonies that got recorded of what God has done. And God's still doing them. And that's why it tells us in 1 Timothy uh, 6, 12, fight, that's the very first word, fight, the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you are also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Well, it says fight, so that means... We can't just sit by and do nothing. See, when Jesus, before he went up into heaven, he said he gave us the keys. Well, you know what the keys are? It's his words. You see, in Genesis, in the very beginning, that's how creation began. God said, let there be light. And then that's, that began creation. And so, in the same way, the words that Jesus used on this earth have the same power when we use them in faith and expect him to, to come through because he is faithful. And it also says that he's not a respecter of persons. So what he'll do for one person, he'll do for all of us. And so we have to be careful 
when we see somebody get blessed, a brother or sister, let's say they get a nice house, they get a new car or something, not to get jealous, but to say, my goodness, if God can do that for them, Amen. how much more can he do it for me? Because he's not a respecter of persons. And see, God, Psalm 23, it says he prepares a banquet for us in the presence of our enemies. Well, that's not just so we can thumb our nose at him and say, look at me. No, it's because God is a good God, and he wants others to see his goodness. You know, I've done this before, but let's say when you go to a restaurant and you have something you really love to eat, you're going to tell others, hey, I went to, to Joe's Crab House. I don't know, you don't like crabs. But, and they were so good that I think you should go there too, right? That's your testimony. But on the other hand, if you went there and you got sick, and maybe while you are there, a couple of animals just came in that didn't look good at all, did it? You're going to say, don't go near that place. Well, that's the same thing we're supposed to do with our walk with God, even more important, because that is our life. It's in Him that we live and move and have our being. And we're not here just to tell you a good word. We're here to tell you it works. That we, First off, He joined us together. We've been married be 12 years this fall. And I, I'm from Vermont. She's been from Nashville. I never thought I'd live in the South. But God, He put us together. And He has a plan. You know, as sweet as our marriage is, it's a threesome though. See, God's in the center between us. And and we serve him together, but also individually. And, to, and for it to work, he has to be the center. And, and he has to be put first. And sometimes that might mean that, that I have to go do something that she'd rather I not do. Or, or vice versa. But we say, okay, God, no, you're first. And we know that you have told us what? That if we seek you first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all else will be added unto us. See, God has a path laid out for us. Before we were even born, he, he wrote all the days of our life in a book. And, and he had a, a purpose for us. But, you know, that's where I think it comes into where animals can get healed, is they know there's a God. They don't doubt that. Animals naturally do the right thing. But God, what did he do when he made us? He said, let us make man in our own image. He made us different. He, see, every now he created from scratch. Us, he created from something he already had. That was dirt. He took dirt that he had already, form, already made. He formed our bodies. But what? We were lifeless. Until what? He breathed his spirit into us. And, and he said, let us make man in our own image. Now, man, he gave us free choice. You know, sometimes I wish he hadn't. I'd much rather just always do the right thing. But yeah. then you're a robot, and God didn't want that. God wants us to love him because we want to love him. It's like my wife. It's out of love for her, and God was good here. She loves Sonic, and she loves Sonic shakes. She loves cherry, cherry limeades. Not expensive, <laughs> but she loves it. See, God's good. So anyways, I will stop and get her one of those and bring it home. Because I have to? No, because I love her and I know it would please her. And it's the same thing with God. He, we don't have to do anything for God, but out of love for what he's done for us, for the price that he paid for us, the fact that Jesus died on the cross where we were yet sinners, and he came to have might have life and have it, what, more abundantly. That's why we want to serve him. It does tell us pretty plainly in, in, in John 14 and 15, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And then if you obey my commandments, the Father and I will come and live with you. We'll, step, we'll, we'll reveal ourselves to you, with you. But you know, it's no different than getting back to natural again, say, working. You can't just go to work and do whatever you want all the time and expect to get paid. Say, so, well, well, you didn't do anything, right? So why do we treat God differently? If anything, he should be the, the most because it says the new commandment that Jesus gave us was what? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. And then love your neighbor as yourself. So we got to put him first. But see, pressures, pressures are real today because especially in households, so often both the husband and wife have to work to try to make ends meet because the world has convinced us that you got to finance everything. That's the only way to do it. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but God says look to him. And, of course, we've got to be faithful with our tithe. You know, we should, we should never eat our seed. It's like if you're a farmer, if you eat all your corn before you plant it, you've got nothing. So, no, we have to be faithful and, and give unto the Lord what is his and let, so he has something to work with to give us a crop. And he's faithful that way. He, he'll come through every time. But it's not just money. It's our heart condition. You see, everything is already God's anyways. God says, it says all the silver and gold are his, and he owns the cattle of a thousand hills, and again, two of them are in that place. Uh, but... What we can bring him, we can't bring him what's already his, but we can bring him our honor. See, it's out of honor for him that we bring it to him. And it's out of honor that we're here. He told us to come here. This started, 
Well, yeah, it'd be five years in, in, in April that we've been doing this ministry. But um, it started two years before that. We, we have a place we go called The Secret Place. It's a national city. It's only 30 minutes from our house, but it's like going out in the water in the summer. It's, it's a little camp on a lake. And uh, we go there on a threesome, alone with God, and we spend time with them. And two years before the nursing home actually started, he laid it on our heart to go to the nursing home. And so we started going in that direction. And then God opened the door. See, God will always tell you, you know, this, you've heard a prophecy where people will tell you, like, go to Africa or whatever. Well, God can and does use prophecy. But I want to let you know this now. If you spend time with him, he will always tell you first. It's not going to be something you've never heard of. That's not from God. God will lay it on your heart first. He'll tell you first what he wants you to do. And then there might be a confirmation, maybe because you're stalling. Maybe you think, I don't know. But then some of you say, well, you know, God told me that you're supposed to go to the nursing home. He didn't do that because we were, we, we, didn't, we were obedient. We tried to get into it. But prophecy is for confirmation. It's not to make you go to Africa. Okay? God will tell you first, so don't get steered wrong. So praise God. He's good. He's faithful. And we see miracles. One, one thing is we expect them. That's right. We expect them because we, because we walk with them, we talk with them. And that's how God warned it from the very beginning. In Genesis, in the very beginning, what's it tell us? That God walked with them and talked with them in the stillness and the coolness of the day. It was about family. You know, God made family first. And then when family failed, he made the church. And now we have a church family. But it's about family. And, and, and families that stay together and pray together or I should say pray together, stay together, and that's so true. See, so often we'll we'll want to rehearse what's happening, like why you're sick or the accident, whereas what we should do first is pray. And I I try to get in that habit. When somebody comes up to me and starts unloading on me what's going on, I say, wait, wait, let's pray first. Let's get the power of God at work here, and then we can talk. But it's God that's going to change this, not me. And so we got to remember to seek him first in all things, and, and, uh, and don't be fearful. There's over 7,000 promises in the Bible, and it's okay if you don't know them, but find what you need at any given time and then stand on it. See, without hesitancy, we, we quick, quickly printed out Isaiah 35 because I knew as soon as I read that verse that one, God was saying, don't be fearful. I know what it looks like. Don't fear it. And then what he said, and this is what will happen, the eyes of the blind will be opened. I didn't doubt after that. I said, I don't know how long this is going to take, but he sees again. And I say, by 8 o'clock tonight, night, he saw her again. So praise God. It's to him be the glory, not us. But it's to encourage each other. We're to build each other up in our most holy faith. That God cares. He knows your needs. You're not alone. And even if all your friends seem to have forsaken you, if you have the Lord, the greater one is within you, and he is fighting your battle. He is there with you. But you've got to stand by faith and trust and obey, like that song says. So there is no other way. Okay? So praise God. He is good. He is faithful. Um, I did want to share, I think, one other verse. Whoop, that's okay. All right. I want to share something out of Hebrews. It says, For we have been, this is Hebrews 3.14, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast till the end. That's another thing. The devil will try to get you to compromise. Now, when, when Lizzie lost her eyesight, she was scared. In fact, we had to get her some drugs just to calm her down. And, and that night, we took turns laying on the floor with her because she was so petrified. Now, Manning, he was pretty cool about it. I mean, he was blind, but he wasn't scared like that. And, and so the devil actually came to me and said, well, you know, he's doing pretty good with that. He could get used to that. He wouldn't, he'd, he'd be fine as a blind dog. Now, see, if I had entertained that thought... That's compromising. I said, no, no, Satan, you're a liar, because I already got the word from God that if I cast my fear on him, that he's going to see again. So I, I couldn't compromise. So it says, for if we become partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. So I didn't compromise. I said, no, I'm not, I'm not accepting that. That's like if you order a whole pizza and there's two slices missing. You're going to accept that? You say, wait a minute. I ordered a pizza. Right? You don't compromise. Get your whole pizza. Well, God had told me in that verse that he, my dog was going to see again. So why would I compromise? I, 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 we kept our confidence in him. It wasn't us. It was in him to the end. And he received his sight back. And so that's just what I want to share, that God is good and he is able and he loves us so much. And I always say that we love you, but God loves you more. Amen. And the fact we're here because we're brothers and sisters in Christ and we're family and we need each other. 
And my wife said earlier that the fact that we're still here means God has something for us to do. Well, remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, first and foremost, that we'll be called the house of prayer. Correct? Now, it's fine to be worshiping and singing. It's fine to be preaching and teaching. But first is prayer. And, and most churches, that's the last thing that happens is prayer. People don't show up for it. But every one of you is still in a position to do the number one job in heaven, and that's pray. Pray for each other. Pray for your leaders. Pray for us. Pray for the ministry. When you hear a siren in the distance, pray for that situation. You know, when we pray, the same dunamis power, it's like where we get the word dynamite, the same dunamis power that raised Christ from the dead is, is in that prayer because we're praying his words. We're, he's promising us that he will, the signs and wonders will follow alongside us. That's what the Greek tells us when we use his words by faith. And, and, and especially when two or three of us are gathered together, he said he's present, and he hears our prayers, and he answers our prayers. So every one of you could do the number one prayer, one, number one job that God has, so that's pray. So I encourage you to take advantage, to pray, to share your cookies with each other, love on each other, and know that God is love. And he's looking for us to be vessels that can show his love to the world. That's what's going to turn the world. Not to be like the world, but to be different than the world. Amen? Well, praise God.